Hello, everyone. I'm Thomas Zimmer. I'm one of the first year fellows. Uh, I think this might actually be the first one of these I've attended um, this year, just as scheduling has worked out. But the topic I'm going to discuss today is I think everyone can guess why this was on my mind. Um, we all remember the events of the Oxford High School end of November this year. And I think a lot of us also experienced a influx of requests from schools, if I put the phrase politely, uh, to evaluate their students, write them a letter saying that this kid isn't going to shoot up the school or else we won't take them back. Um, and that was giving me some thoughts along these lines. Uh, and Dr. Moody had also gotten a Dr. Westbrock to talk at the MCAP uh, last week, which was a very helpful event. But I'll go into a little bit of how school set thrustments are done, kind of what the standards are, and then my project as it relates to that. Some things I wanted to put at the beginning. There isn't much research into school threat assessments, particularly into their efficacy. These are very rare events and they're very hard to study from a preventative standpoint. Um, looking into it, finding the databases of mass shootings in the United States, uh, meeting the cutoff for some reason was arbitrarily set at four fatalities. There have been eight school shootings in the United States that were the student themselves going to a school. Um, and that's in the last 40 years, I should say there's been eight. Um, so hard events to predict. They're low frequency, but just very high consequence. Unfortunately, there are a lot of things we study of the harms that the school assessment process itself does. Uh, these kids are taken out of school for prolonged periods of time. It can be very stressful. And so the research is more of like, how do we do that well? Um, I personally have had three cases of school threat assessment since Oxford. Um, one in PES, I believe one in eight cap, and then one following as an outpatient. And for all of them, this process was incredibly stressful for the patients, us as well, but mostly I meant the patients. So this is Oxford High School at home of the Wildcats and flying all their flags at half mast after the, the death. Um, November 30th, and there were, I believe, four fatalities, all were students, and six students were injured and one teacher was injured. The, and the phrase, I believe, uh, until the court of law has had its procedure, the accused is Ethan Crumbly. He was a 15-year-old sophomore. Um, the weapon he used was a semi-automatic pistol that he'd gotten four days before as an early Christmas present from his family. Part of the reason everyone's so anxious about this, I think particularly from the school point of view, is that there, this has been a particularly litigious event where there have been $200 million lawsuits the last time I checked, there might've been more now, um, leveled against the school and the school officials for their failure to prevent the shooting and ignoring the warning signs, but things were used. Some of the warning signs that we're going to look at include the, some social media postings, um, and the most ominous of them was him posting, now I have become death, destroyer of worlds. See you tomorrow, Oxford. This kind of thing isn't unusual with school shootings, and we'll get more into that in a minute. An element that a lot of the news and the lawsuits as well have focused on is that when Ethan was talking to the guidance counselor and the guidance counselor was talking to his parents about their concerns, the gun was probably in his backpack there at that time. It wasn't searched, it wasn't confiscated. Um, interestingly, backpacks were also just blankly banned in the classrooms and that seemed to not be enforced at the time. I recognize the easy thing to say is, oh, why wasn't the backpack searched? There's the caveat you have to say, well, we have to search every backpack of every kid we're concerned at all about. But that's something we'll go into a little bit more. I thought the quote from the lawyer presenting the lawsuit it's helpful just to think of the kind of inflammatory language that we use around this. Um, I should say we, I mean like the media and just our society at large. At Oxford High School, they'll search your backpack if they think you're vaping, 
but they refused to suspend or search a student who wrote what we now know was reams of homicidal notes and drawing scenes of classroom slaughter and mania. He's an attorney, his job is to try to get his clients uh, compensated in their case, but this is, I think, the pressure that particularly the school systems and the officials themselves are up against. Here are the warning signs that they were discussing. Um, a lot of these are screenshots people took because the post has since been taken down. Um, but he was showing off what he described as his new beauty, uh, semi-automatic pistol. Um, and none of the comments of that were anything other than he really liked having a gun. Um, a post he made previously, uh, which I imagine a lot of people at the time were interpreting as a teenager being morbid, uh, now I'm become death, the destroyer of worlds. Um, see you tomorrow, Oxford. And depending on how you feel, we're either quoting the Bhagavad Gita or Oppenheimer quoting the Bhagavad Gita, but a morbid kind of message that teenagers are somewhat want to have that style. Um, and uh, more of the, the social media posts where again, he's showing off his gun, but in a way that, a lot of our patients in the state of Michigan, uh, guns are part of the culture. A lot of families have guns, they hunt. Um, we should probably assume that a lot more families have guns in the home than are telling us. But now let's get to some of the warning signs that were a little bit more concerning. And this happened the day of the shooting, hours before. Uh, is his math teacher was reviewing um, this piece of homework and had seen a lot of things that were very concerning to her. That is what they then sent to the guidance counselor who asked the parents to come in um, to meet with her. Note that a lot of these sections are scribbled out. The teacher took actually a photo of it before, uh, before it was scribbled out, because this was Ethan learning that his parents were called in and they're gonna show this. So I think he's trying to scribble out the things that were most concerning. And he wrote a bunch of things to make it seem more harmless. Uh, but some of the things that are scribbled out, and I can show you the photo in a minute, are things like, my life is useless, blood everywhere. So here is the thoughts won't stop. What's scribbled out is help me. Um, this is a drawing of a person lying on the ground in a pool of blood with what looks like two gunshot wounds. Um, drawing of a bullet, a crying face, and then the innocuous things that were added later of, I love my life so much. We're all friends here. Oxford High School rocks. Harmless act. Video game this is. Um, notably, it's not clear exactly what happened in the session, but the, if the parents were asked about access to guns or not, but the parents certainly didn't disclose that they'd recently purchased him a gun. And they didn't seem to try to figure out if he had it on him or where it was at home. Um, this has actually led to the parents being indicted for negligence. And then there was the multi-day manhunt that all of us probably remember. Um, he ended up going back to class and had access to his, his backpack. This is the worksheet from before he'd written on it. And you can see that he did a kind of startlingly detailed drawing of a gun, phrase blood everywhere, uh, the world is dead, my life is useless. And I thought very interestingly, the help me was crossed out. At the time, some of what the school's reporting is that Ethan was calm and cooperative with the school staff. Uh, he hasn't had prior disciplinary action. He wasn't seen as a bad kid. Um, the parents were pretty resistant to the suggestion of taking him out of school. And so at that time, it was made as a suggestion. Um, and the, the language around it the seems like the parents weren't felt to be cooperative. So the school told them that they had 48 hours to seek counseling for him or they contact CPS. It's kind of an interesting intervention. Um, reminds me a lot of when schools just send these kids to PES for us to handle the problem. But it's curious, 48 hours isn't very urgent and seeking counseling for him doesn't seem like it's reacting to this threat. I would note that it seems like people had been concerned previously that he was depressed, he wasn't getting the care he was needing, and that uh, family didn't seem to be interested in getting him mental health care. Going farther back into his history, some of the things that were 
thing to contribute to this. His only friend, he was a pretty isolated kid, moved away the summer before. His dog had recently died and people were thinking he was depressed around that. And a neighbor had called CPS because his parents would leave him home alone without a phone, had a way to contact help. Well, they went out to the bars. Um, I say most of this is coming from news sources. I haven't evaluated this family or done this investigation, but this is the information we have available right now. Um, it reports that he'd sent text to his mother since March that he was seeing demons and ghosts inside of the home. Report that he videotaped himself torturing animals. Now, now, if that's something that's been substantiated, a lot of this is an ongoing criminal investigation. So um, some of that has been revealed to the public, some of it hasn't. Uh, he apparently made Molotov cocktails and used them in his backyard. And there's reports that he actually drew a sketch of himself committing a school shooting. So what do we do with this? Uh, what, what is the standard here? There are some guidelines. Um, a number of them are from the federal government and a couple are from more clinical associations. The, all of these actually, uh, the concept of threat assessment in this actually starts with the US Secret Service. Uh, they're the ones who kind of came up with the art of the threat assessment. Originally, it was threats posed towards political figures, presidents, but they've expanded their purview to include terroristic threats towards schools and school shootings. FBI has made a number of profiles will collect information of all the instances of gun violence in schools in the United States. Uh, the Ho Department of Homeland Security, since it's existed in the past couple of decades, has taken this into their aegis. And the Department of Education has collaborated with other agencies to come out with guidelines to give to schools. Um, the main one coming out of academic centers, uh, you'll see this referenced a lot in the research. Uh, until 2018, it was called the Virginia Student Threat Assessment Guidelines. Uh, now it's called the Comprehensive School Threat Assessment Guidelines as they're trying to market it outside of the state of Virginia. Um, and the National Association of School Psychologists have also put out their guidelines. So they, all of these fundamentally agree with each other. But if you're interested in looking up the, the current ones, the uh, Protecting U.S. Schools by the Secret Service um, that one, I believe, is a 62-page one uh, that's mostly just documenting all of the, the cases and the patterns we've seen. But the most usable one is enhancing school safety using a threat assessment model, an operational guide for preventing school targeted school violence. Um, and that one is actually 32 pages and surprisingly readable. And it is just an operational guide of here's how you design a school threat assessment model in a school. They've put this all into a readily accessible schoolsafety.gov that um, trying to make it as easy as possible for schools to be able to pick, pick this up. Some states have mandated that schools come up with these threat assessment models, um, and then they pick up various ones of these. Many states haven't, and there isn't much consistency at all in how these are implemented. The CSTAG is coming out of a group led by Dewey Corn. Cornell out of the University of Virginia. He's a clinical and forensic psychologist, um, very well regarded, widely used. He's made it an industry of a turnkey operation where you can basically have your school officials trained in this, um, boot, basically boot camp models. They'll give you all the materials and you can just enact this in your school system. Um, he's his group has done a lot of research into after implementing the CSTAG, what it looks like. Some of the things that they've noted is that it seems to reduce what's a fairly significant racial disparity in the suspensions, expulsions, and disciplinary actions that come out from school threat assessment. Of uh, it closes and based on his claim, eliminates the gap between African American and white students. Um, and particularly that it reduces the amount of time that students lose due to suspensions and expulsions, basically. Think of it as the harm that is done by the school threat assessment model. Amongst psychiatrists, uh, Deborah Weisbrot, who is kind enough to speak for the MCAP, I think on the March 6th, um, has been kind of the leader within our, sub, our subspecialty. And she has a wonderful article that was published January 2021 of the need to see and respond. It's very concise, eight pages, very practical. Um, if anyone doesn't feel very confident in how to do this and want to learn more, I would recommend starting with her. And I have links at the end. Um, her actual whole career is 
she runs a school threat assessment clinic that particularly hard cases are referred to for these elaborate 20, 40 hour evaluations. Some of the things that all of the guidelines agree on, I'm borrowing a lot of phrases, particularly from Dr. Uh, Weisbrot, is never worry alone. They always describe a multidisciplinary team of professionals that are based out of the schools um, and they want to include mental health professionals. These are typically psychologists or social workers, these school administrators themselves, and frequently the either local law enforcement or a school resource officer, which is a uh, law enforcement officer who's embedded within the schools. We, this is the typical composition of the team. I'll point out that physicians, psychiatrists, ER staff are not the standard model. We'll have these kids show up in PES and we're told to do this evaluation and come up with the answer, but that's probably not the right place to do these assessments. Even an acute hospitalization is, has a lot of limitations in terms of the amount of time and we can get into what you're supposed to do and why this is hard to do in those settings. Point that all of them stress is that the collateral is critical and you want to get, we talk about collateral in our field frequently, uh, this is going above and beyond. You need to interview the kid, you need to interview their parents, their teachers, all peers who might know about this, their friends, school resource officers, anyone who's been involved in treatment for them, look through all their school records, see any social media, see any thing they produced, talk to their neighbors to see how you, this kid is viewed in the community. You can see why, particularly in the cases that are more borderline or concerning, this is a massive undertaking. Another important point is that there isn't a profile as much as I think the FBI was really hoping there would be when they analyzed the massive amount of data, they eventually came to the conclusion that we think there is, but we wanted to think there is, but there isn't. There's this image after Columbine of teens or social misfits wearing black leather dusters who are murdering their bullies in revenge and practicing with video games while listening to death metal. Um, Fortunately, that doesn't tend to be true. There have been female shooters. They're much more rare than male. There have been middle schoolers. It can be kids who are loners or kids who are popular, seem to be going along fine. Kids who are struggling academically, kids who are on the honor roll. Um, another particular issue has been after Sandy Hook, Adam Lanza uh, value as being autistic and having some of the perseverative thoughts were real relating to the violence is linked to that, that are individuals with autism of particularly higher risk. And if you had a kid with autism, you'd be more worried. That hasn't been substantiated. There isn't any evidence to connect autism and school shootings. Um, there's probably a small subset of people with autism who focus on that and it's something to be can, you'd want to explore. But people with autism are much more likely to be victims of violence and it's not seen as a particular risk factor. So rather than focusing on profiles, the focus should be on the signs and behaviors that can serve to warn. The warning behaviors that we get into fall into certain categories. This is the first main cons uh, consolidation or uh, listing of this was by Moller and O'Toole in 2011, and most of the subsequent uh, guidelines basically just come back and cite this paper. First is pathway, and this is anything that's preparation or leading up. Is this person looking at means? Are they planning it out? Are they drawing how they're gonna move through the school? Are they looking up weapons? Uh, very commonly, are they looking up how other school shooters have done it? So you'll run into kids are in trouble because they've been Googling ammunition, and it was something that Ethan was doing, Googling ammunition at the school. Fixation, and this tends to become a fixation with the person in our cause. Frequently, that's previous school shooters, um, or it can be manifestos, but just this continually going farther and farther down this rabbit hole of fixating with this isolating thing. Similar line is identification. The phrase they frequently used to describe this is a pseudo commando, a warrior mentality, or even just directly identifying as the past shooters as who they're imagining themselves to be. Another frequent warning is novel aggression. The particular element of novel here is you have individuals who have plenty of 
well ingrained instincts not to do violence to other individuals and they're testing their ability to overcome those instincts and those inhibitions and this can be violence towards peers violence towards animals but they're basically testing out their ability to pull the trigger uh, frequently there'll be a burst of energy um, and this can be just general um, kind of described almost as what would make you a little bit concerned for mania leakage is an important one that we'll discuss in more depth this is communication of intent or planning to a third party one issue with this is we everyone every case we know of to study tends to be because of leakage all of the people that we're evaluating to see if they're going to be a school shooter we wouldn't be evaluating them if there wasn't leakage um, and the last is a directly communicated threat has this individual just told the target or told law enforcement that they're planning to enact violence. And then the last resort, and this one strikes me as similar to what I think about suicide threat assessments of increasing desperation or despair. One thing I would point out is that most school shootings and essentially homicides are also suicides. And the risk factors that we'd be thinking about should also be similar to a suicide threat assessment. We think we need to look very closely at their internet activity in this day and age. Are they looking at school shooter fan clubs? Are they studying school shooters and tactics? Are they researching weapons? Um, are they having those preoccupations we talked about before? Death, revenge, warrior mentality. Um, an important point of this is if you send me a 14 year old in PES and I'm evaluating them, I don't have access to their Twitter or their Instagram. But this is a point you can call in law enforcement that they can search a student's phone or social media easily with parental permission. But if you're particularly concerned, this is also something maybe a search warrant is needed. Uh, the most of the school shooters do disclose their plans in some way to peers. I should say many school shooters disclose their plans to peers. Um, there can be frequently drawings and imagining like we had with Ethan. Um, they will do social media postings, warning about it. And some of these are things of like telling you know, people not to show up tomorrow. They will write, and sometimes this is full manifestos, but a reason that you probably do want to ask the family to bring the, the kids' journals in so you can read them. Um, I think I should bring up that makes this tricky is that it, while this is a fairly sensitive thing for leakage, it isn't terribly specific. Many cases that aren't seen as, substan as substantial threats will have some kind of morbid theme or a kid looking up guns at school that's going to bring them to our attention. So you do need to look at the context and try to figure out, to help figure out how much you need to worry about it. One thing that is very vital and probably where that was somewhat lacking in this case, although it might have been lacking in the case of the parents, was being a very thorough means assessment. Uh, weapons overall, but of course in this country that primarily means guns. And this isn't just the, are there guns at the home? Do the grandparents have guns? Do they might have access to their friends? Do they hunt? Are they on the skeet team? Really being exhaustive and trying to figure out if this person could get means. Um, this is another place that it might make sense to engage law enforcement. Especially if you're not confident that the parents are reliable, law enforcement can go and they can go into the home. They can talk to the parents and be a little bit more convincing than you are. Um, this is something that did not come up to me as an option before I was working on this project or doing these readings that calling the police that I normally view as a threat to my patients, but might be something that's helpful or necessary in these cases. Another thing these guidelines agree on, zero tolerance policies that I think we're all very familiar with do not tend to be helpful. Uh, they don't promote safety. There's nothing keeping a kid who is expelled from showing up at school the next day with a weapon. Um, it does increase their isolation, their anger, their resentfulness. It does isolate them from individuals who care about them and support them. And they're taking individuals who are already tend to be psychiatrically, psychologically struggling and making them more vulnerable. Um, so. This is probably, if we're optimistic, just a misunderstanding on school's parts of how to keep their school safe, but it's probably also a lot of medical legal just covering yourself. And the point where all of the systems get to for the guidelines is how do we delineate these threats between ones that we worry about and ones we don't. 
the common term that's used for the ones that we're not as concerned about are transient threats. And this can be people who are just angry or they're you know, making a joke um, or some other easily resolved issue. Instance that I had is a, a kid who was suspended, I believe for multiple months because he was looking, uh, Googling images of guns at school so he could make an FBI cat meme. So that was a zero tolerance policy. He was just out. Um, but anyone looking at this case had no other indications that this kid was a risk. This wasn't seemingly a substantial threat. It wasn't related to him harming others. The meme wasn't about threatening people. Um, so most of the evaluation systems would pretty rapidly come to the conclusion with this individual that this was a transient threat. More substantive threats, unfortunately, are not uncommon. And this is something that communicates a serious intent to harm others. And different guidelines have different rating systems, but they all essentially get to the same point of how worried should you be. Some unfortunate examples uh, are, this was, I believe, before the uh, Umpqua Community College shooting, and this was October 1st. 2015 in Roseburg, Oregon. Um, this is a site called 4chan, uh, which is known both for being anonymous and having a dedication to misanthropy. Um, and so you can see that person saying that some of you guys are all right, don't go to school tomorrow if you're near Austin, um, telling people to look out basically in the news. And the individuals replying to the post were wishing them good luck with, I think, making it seem go to a and instead that they know what this person was referencing. Um, similar case was related to this of uh, same sentiment, don't go to school tomorrow if you're in the Northwest. Um, the last point to really focus on for the prevention element is the focus, similar to a suicide, how we are not very good at predicting who is going to attempt suicide or not. Our focus shouldn't be, can we try to have this perfect prediction? It should be, how do we reduce the odds as much as possible? Um, if we can't make the prediction, we just need to try to affect the odds. What can we improve? It bears repeating that means reduction and restriction is the one of the most important steps. A very important point is that even the transient threats do have a pretty high likelihood of this in the study of having unaddressed mental health issues. This might be the cry for help for anxiety or depression. Kids who are doing well are unlikely to do something like this. Um, so maybe the response is just that this kid needs to be connected to therapy and appropriate mental health resources. Um, this is actually a fairly sensitive indicator uh, in this case. The other important elements for the mitigation and why this doesn't make sense to just happen in TES is that in the models, a, the school-based team should be following the student for a long period of time, making sure the recommendations are followed and reevaluating the risk and doing everything they can to mitigate it. So this isn't, this isn't a once and done. Um, again, do, does law enforcement need to be involved? One reason I keep bringing it up is that if you have cases where you don't feel the parents are well engaged, which I'll say a lot of the cases that then end up, end up in the news about school shooters, somewhere along the lines, there's someone will make a comment of the parents didn't seem to be that interested in the safety factors. Um, if you don't have that agreement with parents, it's not as simple as we told the parents to remove the guns, they didn't want to, it's on them. Um, this might be something where you do need to bring in law enforcement. Particularly, even if the parents are saying they're doing it, do it, but you're not confident, does it need to be the law enforcement who's following up? Um, some of the options, particularly for cases that you feel are higher risk, is this someone who needs a forensic hospitalization for you to try to figure out exactly what's going on for them, how high of a risk, what plan do you need? At the highest level of risk, do they just need to be incarcerated? If they've made a direct threat, particularly, that does count as a significant offense. Do they just need to be incarcerated for the safety of everyone involved, even since before the assessment has happened. Uh, a more in-between option might be maybe they shouldn't stay at that school, but maybe they do better in a therapeutic school setting. Um, even as far as do they have IEP needs that aren't being met. And of course, it does bear emphasizing the duty to warn, it, particularly if there is a discrete target. Um, and do you need to tell those targets? Do you need to tell law enforcement? This varies by states, so I won't go too far into it, but it's just always something that we need to be conscious of. 
Uh, and of course, the document, like it's going to be read aloud in court, because with some frequency it will be. Um, getting into my project I was doing in response to this um, is looking into as a child health and psychiatry fellow, I didn't really feel like I had great grounding going into this, what I was supposed to be doing. Um, looking at the literature on how much our house officers are trained in this, what does that look like? And I am being glib here, and I promise I researched it many other ways to verify there seems to be no literature on this, it hasn't been studied at all. Um, then making the hypothesis that house officers are not comfortable doing school threat assessments feels like the making the hypothesis that water is wet. Um, but if we're getting to the point if we want to maybe change this, it, it's helpful to prove that water is wet first before you ask for policy changes or anyone to put their money where their mouth is. What I'm doing specifically is a survey of house officers, and I want to reach out and thank all of my uh, fellow, the first and second years for doing this on short notice for me. Um, my IR, IRB cleared faster than I thought it'd be, so we actually had it before the, the talk with Dr. Weiss brought, but yeah, since this is a pretty quick anonymous online survey, I, think I timed myself doing it at two minutes, and it's just what exposure have you had to school threat assessments, didactics and school threat assessments, and how do you feel doing them? My goal will be sending this to a national distribution of sending it probably to program directors to share with their clinics, uh, or with their, sorry, with their fellows. Um, right now, my focus is on child health and psychiatry fellows with my IRB. I did extend that to general psychiatry residents, pediatric residents, family medicine residents, because those are also people that this might walk into their ER. Um, obviously, it'd be more of a focus for us, but somewhere we might expand. And the early results I have from, this is just University of Michigan and our Wayne State program. Um, the 15, I did not take this because I, I'm running it, but I can say where my numbers would be. Looking at the answers, only one person had any didactic exposure in residency, four individuals were exposed in fellowship. Um, the majority of people hadn't done any school threat assessments at all. Uh, and I should say, if I was included in this, it would be six of 15 had done between one to five and one unfortunate individual has done at least six. Most of the, as I was expecting most of this to occur in emergency room settings um, and in patient psychiatric units, but I was surprised how often this is actually in the outpatient clinic. Um, I would be curious to the story of whoever had this happen in the consult liaison service, but it's just helpful to think about where this is happening and are these appropriate settings for it. Some of the, this is just a very basic confidence and familiarity types of questions. Are you confident to perform this evaluation? As you can see here, most people aren't. Are you confident documenting it? Again, most people aren't. Are you confident writing that letter that the school is demanding? Here you notice people really aren't. Uh, do you feel helpless? And most people are. Are you feeling frustrated? And this one again is overwhelmingly people are feeling frustrated being asked to do the school threat assessment. And I feel this is because we're being asked to do something we're not confident in doing. Um, and do you believe that all psychiatrists should be trained in doing school threat assessments? I think it, it looks like at least two individuals are thinking, no, this shouldn't be part of our job. Um, but the majority of individuals do agree that it is something that we should have more explicit training in. Where I hope to take this uh, from here is expanding this survey to a national audience. And typically you get between 10 and 15, 20% of responses and there's just under 900 child adolescent fellows in the country right now. So that would get me numbers around like 120 is what I'd be hoping for for responses. Uh, some of the, my demographic section did also include like where is the program located and some things like that. because. Uh, Obviously, this is very salient to us in Michigan right now after the Oxford shooting, but these tend to happen fairly frequently on the West Coast. But I don't know if this would be something that people in the Midwest would be as, or uh, people in like, other parts of the country would be as aware of. Uh, of course, one place we might, depending on the results of the study, should it be considered that school threat assessments, be it having didactics on it, be a GME requirement? Um, 
of all those things that people probably aren't going to have lectures on it unless you make them. Um, and this is more of a something that has been talked about between fellows a lot of should we have a school threat assessment template for how we respond. Things I feel would be particularly important to include is for us to describe the limitations of us doing an acute assessment of we can't say in PES with high confidence, what is this kid going to do? We can talk about things that are concerning to us. We can talk about factors that things are going to be improved to mitigate it. But we probably should also touch in that the standards are that the school should have a team based in following this. And maybe we're even referring them to the national guidelines on how to do this. Um, and here is my wall of reference text. Um, and here are the resources I was encouraging people to follow before. The first one is Dr. Weinbrot's article, and I'll copy these into the chat, um, followed by the uh, Secret Service is 32 page description of how you'd set up one of these programs. And uh, the last is the ACAPS uh, resource library on youth and guns. So just going to copy that chat if anyone wants it. And I'd be happy to take any questions anyone has. Thank you, Thomas. That was that was a fantastic talk. I just, I guess, what I want to reiterate to people, having now heard uh, Dr. Weisbrot give the talk, was this: not worrying alone. And I know it sounds intuitive. However, I, I do think it is it is a very different way of operating than the way we've operated in the past around school threat assessments. Um, at least. And I don't know if other people in the audience can comment if their experiences have been, di been different, but often we do like an in real time threat assessment and then write a letter um, kind of commenting on the in real time assessment and then stating we can't really comment on the future. However, using this not worry alone model really, you know, according to Dr. Weisbrot really is about kind of putting it back on the school um, in a lot of ways to say, um, you know, we cannot conduct a, like a full threat assessment in a brief period of time. It really requires a full thorough investigation of risk, um, which would require the involvement of a multidisciplinary team, in particular, a school team. 